Good morning, class. Welcome to your daily current affairs on Paper Hindu. Let's see for today's articles. Center to reconsider safe harbor clause in IT law. So, IT law was initially framed in 2000. So, currently they are trying to reconsider this safe harbor clause. So, what is this safe harbor clause? So, the new Digital India Act 2003. So, we have to see what is this article, of, what is this act about and will be a comprehensive overhaul of the country's cyber laws. Many rounds of consultations will be held before it introduced in the parliament says Rajiv Chandrasekhar. So, he is MOS of electronics and information technology. He has mentioned that yes, definitely we will be considering, reconsidering this clause of safe harbor. So, what is this? What is the safe harbor initially? The government is considering a key aspect of cyberspace which is safe harbor which is the principle that the so called intermediaries on the intermediate are not responsible for the third parties post on their website. That means whoever are the social media, so social media jains are there, so these people are holding the social media and this particular platform whatever the posts are being posted by the intermediaries then they are not responsible for the post ok. So, currently this article says that yes. <clears throat> so, the government is reconsidering on the aspect of safe harbor which is the principal so called intermediaries do not involve. So, directly the intermediaries in the middle will not be involving in the any post concerned that is your safe harbor and this is the principle which allows your social media platforms to avoid liability for posts made by users. So, whatever the posts made by the users that will that will be least responsible for the social media people. That means let's let's say I'm owning Instagram. Okay. So, whatever the posts that are being present in that particular uh, platform, if at all it is triggering any other sections, then that post is liable to be removed from that particular platform. So, it is a responsibility of that particular end person too. So, now currently what does the safe harbor clause is that it will be, it will make immune for these intermediaries that they will not be responsible for the posts which are made by the end users. Okay. So, what they have mentioned is currently we will rethink this decision. We will rethink if this safe harbors for the intermediaries or the social media platform should be existing or not. Okay. So, that is about this article and the safe harbor has been drained in the recent years by the regulations as part of your IT 2000. So, information technology intermediary guidelines digital media ethics code of 2021 which required platforms to take down posts when ordered by the government or required by law. So, here the condition is that IT code of conduct. So, IT intermediary guidelines and digital media code. Intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code twenty twenty one have a guidelines such that whoever are the intermediates, so let let's say any of the social media platform intermediaries. So whoever are there, these people will be having certain responsibility. For suppose I am an end, end user, I have posted something, I have posted some post and it triggered a particular section of community. I am using their platform, right? So, it is responsibility of this particular in, in, intermediaries to take down this post if it is triggering some kind of sections. That is as part of this rules. But now currently your digital media code digital act. So, through your digital India act 2023 they are coming up with a law called safe harbor. So, one of their constraints is safe harbor where intermediaries will no longer be or least responsible for the post which are posted in their particular social media right. So, still that is under consideration not yet to be yet to be into force ok. Good morning Ashwant. Good morning Ashwant. So, yeah, that is about this article. So, once the time permits, let us see about your Digital India 2023. Once at any time, we will be seeing this, okay. This is important for your governance part, also important for your SNTs 
as part of your digital space. So your uh, cyber security wise, it's important. Okay, fine. GS3. Here he has mentioned one thing that fundamental speech rights cannot be violated by any platform by the minister said but there is a case that there cannot be made weaponization of disinformation is not same as the free speech and needs to be addressed that means of course there is a right that your fundamental rights can be assured through your freedom of speech and expression but not at the cost of weaponization so you should not be using this freedom of free speech for disinformation or weaponization of the existing data that is what he has mentioned right next so you are mr rajesh Ch uh, chandrasekhar is your ministry of state for your mighty that means electronics and information technology so he has speculated all these things right next Keeping up the local news, fine. Long lost moth species caught on camera in Tamil Nadu in forests. So it was around 200 back, so around long moth species around 200 year or 127 years ago this particular moth, see, moth was seen in this area and now after such a long time it was witnessed in Tamil Nadu forest. So what does this moth called? important for your environment can be asked in your prelims. So as part of your prelims, such type of uh, things can be asked. So what does this article say? Two researchers from Tamil Nadu have spotted the rare moth species for the first time in India in the buffer zone of Kalakkad and Mundutarai tri Tiger Reserve in Tamil Nadu. So it is in the buffer zone after it last sighted 127 years ago in Trikonomal in Sri Lanka. So, 127 years back it was it was sighted in Sri Lanka and after that this is for the first time this particular moth has been witnessed and this moth name is Mimismania silonica. So that is its name, simple remember that this was uh, discovered during or after 127 years okay and this is a moth okay moth fine. Rest all they have given details about it which is not required. Next, your local news. India top 10 security partner says Australian Prime Minister Albanese. Now if you can see in the past, uh, past two weeks span or past one week span it is evident that Australia is showing keen interest to have for its foreign policy strengthened with India. That is why it has made certain MOUs in education where they have mentioned that Education Minister of Australia has visited and he has mentioned that yes, we, have, we will be establishing two universities of Australia in gift city, Gujarat. And then now there was two visits, For, I mean two visits, one is regarding our defense. So defense ties with them and next one is trade. So these two things, so currently our relation with Australia strengthened regarding education and other sector which is your defense and the other one is your trade okay so first thing coming to your i have already discussed about your education part now discussing about defense so we have a top tire security and prime minister anthony albanese he has visited india recently only during the uh, holi and he has speculated that he has mentioned that abroad ins vikrant in mumbai he says bilateral ties are increasing strategic importance while navigating the challenges of the region together Earlier in Ahmedabad, he watched the fourth test between two nations with Narendra Modi. So what is actually happening here? Australia will host exercise Malabar for the first time, very important. For the first time, they are going to have this naval exercise called exercise Malabar with India and we are also going to participate for the first time in Australia's Talisman Sabre exercise. Directly in your prelims, this can be asked like, Talisman Sabre is a joint exercise between which countries? India and Australia. Same with exercise Malabar. Okay. Next, Australian Prime Minister Anthony has an announced on Wednesday. So that is what he has announced that we will be having this joint exercises with India for the first time and that are two exercises. One is Malabar exercise and second one is your Talisman Sabre exercise. So yeah, 
and he has visited this INS Vikrant, which is our indigenous aircraft carrier. Aircraft carrier, earlier when we were discussing about SNT, I mentioned clearly about this aircraft carrier, INS Vikrant. So, they have, uh, he has visited this and my visit to India by my, reflects my government's commitment to place India at the heart of Australia's approach to the Indo-Pacific and beyond. So, he has mentioned that it is Australia and India together working for Indo-Pacific security. So, we are working for the Indo-Pacific security and free and open access to sea lanes in the Indo-Pacific. So, we are currently working for that. That is what they have mentioned. So, that is why we have a strong strategic alignment with India. So, our interest is with Indo-Pacific region. This is what mentioned by Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Okay. So, he has mentioned that we have a strong connection. Definitely, we will take this ahead. Yeah. So, currently, the news is about the joint exercises. Okay. Next. MOU on semiconductors will help India bigger role in electronic supply, says US. So, aircraft material, semiconductor devices from Boeing. So, Boeing aircraft, so that is again a company in your US. So, we are having a particular tie. Air India's decision to purchase 220 Boeing aircrafts will create a tremendous number of jobs. So, recently there was another article in this, like in the past one month or time. Or time. So, it has mentioned clearly that pilots are running out of employment. Very few, one in five I think, are at the level of employment that are they are able to get. So, unemployment rate in aircraft is increasing in India because of lack of this aircrafts. So, currently this Boeing 220 purchase of 220 Boeing aircrafts would increase the jobs in the country. Okay. So, tremendous number of jobs in the United States says US common U.S. Commerce uh, Secretary Gina M. Raimondo on Thursday. So, she has mentioned that Air India's decision to purchase Boeing aircraft will create these jobs and before restarting the U.S. commercial dialogue, the visiting official said the two countries will sign an MOU on semiconductors that would support India's aspiration to play a leading role in electronic supply. We know that this time electronics rate will be increased actually. So, later on it will be decreased, she has mentioned that the rate of this electronic semiconductors will be decreased because of this MOU. So, India's role in the international arena for semiconductors will be increased, that is what she has mentioned, right. Next. However, you need to know that through budget they have clearly mentioned that on semiconductor devices or chips, basically these gadgets will be lowering price in this particular budget because customs duty on this has been reduced. If you would have seen the budget uh, speculations when we were uh, seeing this budget news on the other day, it is clearly mentioned that the cost burden on semiconductors will be reduced generally. Why? Because customs duty was reduced that was talked and now because of this MOU it is clear that it will be further reduced okay and India's rate or India's stand in semiconductors in the international arena will increase will strengthen next full trade deal be in place by Q3 says Australia's Farrell so I told you education was done now they have got that we are entering into defense partnership with the country now, this is the third one where they are interested, who Australians are interested to have trade deal with India. So, what is this about? Comprehensive Economic Cooperation. Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement lends great opportunities to expand ties between Australian Minister for Trade and Tourism expresses cons confidence in timeline citing political will. So, they are interested to have trade relations with us and what is the trade relations? Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement. So, Australian Minister of Trade, Don Farrell is confident that a, co uh, that a comprehensive economic co cooperation agreement which is your CECA will be placed in the third quarter of this year. So, they are trying to establish this particular relationship with India and how we are going to get benefited. That is mentioned in this other article, same one related to your Australia itself. What does this article say? 
So she, he, they have mentioned that with this particular agreement, more than 85% of the Australian goods exported value to India are tariff free. That means 85% of the goods that are being exported from Australia and imported to India will be tariff free. At the same time, 96% of the imported goods from India to Australia, that means we are exporting 96% of the goods, whatever the goods, around 96% of the goods will be tariff free. So that is what Australia has mentioned through this trade deal and by this quarter 3, Q3 of the upcoming Q3, we will be having this agreement done. Next, Australian fresh lobster, lamb used to be subjected to 30% of tariff. So this lamb and lobster account for 30% of tariff and tariffs on the other products like so our exports and imports, avocado, citrus, seafood are on the pathway to zero. I look forward to bustling restaurants of Mumbai and Delhi right through India showcasing these great Australian products with a glass of premium Australian wine alongside. So what they are doing, these particular products, whatever it is, avocado, citrus, seafood, all these will be having zero tariff so that all these can be imported and can be utilized for the greater purpose. That is what Australian deal for trade okay so yeah next so that is what he has mentioned the same thing here so already we have seen the first phase first evidence for the free trade agreement and then we are trying to proceed for CECA around 2.5 billion in trade from India came from Australia came into India under low tariffs so under the low tariff ambience almost 2.5 billion trade is, is expected okay so in January it has already came so it has came around 2.5 million now I think certainly our point of view that gives great opportunities to expand our relationship overall bilateral trade between India and Australia has increased has showcased that through January itself 2.5 billion was the case and now because of this particular agreement if it comes into force definitely it will increase this ambient so that is about this article let's go to the next one inflation to ease in financial year 24 but monsoon is a key risk so from the past, whenever I was discussing about your anything related to your climate, Indian climate, I was clearly mentioning that cold wave has occurred because of La Nina previously. Now 50% of the chances are there for occurrence of El Nino in the country. So now our CEA, Chief Economic Advisor, Mr. Anant Nageshwaran, so he is responsible for your economic survey. Chief Economic Advisor itself is the person who will be giving you economic survey, right? So he has mentioned that it might, this inflation would be at the easing level. So we can achieve the targeted inflation, but the main role would be monsoon because there is a increased chances of El Nino conditions in the country. Could be, have be bearing on the monsoon which in turn would impact the food prices, inflation and economic growth. So inflation alone would not be the issue it can be eased but when it comes to your food inflation because of the this instability because of this instability in your uh, climatic conditions and uh, possible occurrences of El Nino conditions in the country definitely there will be a possibility of food inflation which again further impacts your inflation and economic growth of the country that is what has been mentioned by your Chief Economic Advisor Anantha Nageshwaran, right? Next. So, it is not much important. Yes. So, your last article. The elusive political solution in Sri Lanka. So, through this article, sorry, through this 13th constitution amendment, yes, 13th amendment, provincial councils were given. So, we will see this clearly. I will show you first what is this 13th council. Okay, let me go the gist first and then let me go to a 13th amendment of Sri Lanka. How is it related to India? Why am I discussing about something constitutional amendment for Sri Lanka with India? Two things. First is Sri Lanka our bordering country. Number two, this is related to Tamilians who fled, who migrated to Sri Lanka from India and India's interest towards this Sri Lanka. Currently, we can see that through IMF, 
India was the one who has donated, who has uh, been as a person or been as a member who assured for loan repayment in IMF. That is when Sri Lanka got their loans and we ourselves given certain grants, huge grants for Sri Lanka. So now the issue is that because of this huge amounts going from our country, their foreign policy is a kind tilted towards favorable conditions to India and Tamilians who are residing in Sri Lanka. So, now we need to know what is this 13th amendment and before that let me go to the gist and then we will go to that. Okay? So, the deadline that Sri Lankan President Ranil set to resolve the pending ethnic question expired a month ago having seen several unkept promises in the past, Tamils content that the Southern Sinhalese establishment does not have a political will to find a just and durable political solution. So, now this is a growing issue between Sinhalese and Tamilians. Sinhalese are majority of the people and Tamilians are also there. Now the issue starts with these both. Already it is existing. First let me go to the gist. So, Ranil announced that he would ensure that the country's long pending ethnic question, addition on the 13th amendment is resolved by February 4th, 2023, the day Sri Lanka marked 75 years of its independence from colonial era. So, 13th amendment has always been contentious. So, Sinhalese are completely opposing it. Why? We will see. The legislation is an Indian imposition symbolizing too much power for the Tamilians at the provincial level. So, the Tamilians on the other hand have maintained the legislation under Sri Lanka's unitary constitution and has very limited powers that they do not have meaningful devolutions. So, currently these people, just a moment. Yes, let me go to that article. So, what they have mentioned is because of this uh, growing issue or support to Tamilians at the provincial levels through this 13th amendment, 13th amendment they have created this provincial councils giving certain priority to Tamilians. Now, they are mentioning that because this particular lack of decision on 13th amendment is only due to the growing pressure or growing foreign policy towards India. That is what Sinhalese say. On the contrast, Tamilians say that despite we having this provincial councils, we do not have proper uh, responsibility. That means we do not have proper powers at the constitutional level because it is a unitary constitution and we do not have such more powers as Sinhalese are speculating. So, while India was historically an arbiter for Sri Lanka's Tamil national question, many in Tamil polity and community say New Delhi's interest in influence on issue and waning. So, now we will see this article. Let me go to that particular article and then let me come back to this article. Okay? We will go and see what is your 13th constitution amendment. So, we will see what is this 13th constitution first. So, this is a 2020 article, but yeah, 13th constitution is still existing. So, we can take this article. It has been it clearly mentioned about what is this 13th article about and why it is contentious. That means, why it is controversial, why it is triggering these issues. Just a moment. Uh, is asking for this.
just a moment, I need to log in this. So, what is this legislation? It is an outcome of this particular legislation 13th amendment is an outcome of Indo and Lanka that means Indian and Sri Lankan accord of 1987 signed by the prim, uh, Prime Minister back then the Prime Minister was Rajiv Gandhi he and that Prime Minister of Sri Lanka Jaya uh, Vardhane. So, in an attempt to resolve Sri Lanka's ethnic conflict. So, ethnic conflict is between Sinhalese, Sinhalese speaking people and Tamilians who migrated from India to Sri Lanka. So, yeah, that aggravated the full fledged civil war between the armed forces of LTTE, liberation of Tamil tigers, sorry, liberation of tigers of Tamil Elam, LTTE, which led to the struggle for Tamil self determination and sought for a separate state. So, back then, their rights were not being similar to your apartheid movement in South Africa. So, their rights were not and addressed. So, the government considered them as a minority or they have not given proper rights to these people. That is when civil war has started during 1980s and that is when they have asked for separate statehood in Sri Lanka. So, 13th amendment which led to the creation of provincial councils assured a power sharing arrangement to, to enable 9 provinces in the country including Sinhala majority areas to self govern. So, through this particular 13th amendment, what it has done is 9 provinces, creation of provincial councils were there, out of which 9 provinces were majority people are Sinhalese people, even those 9 provinces were also given for self-governing. To ensure this power sharing mechanism, to ensure a kind of federalism in them, they have introduced this 13th amendment so that certain areas were Tamilians are residing, they have given, they have made it as a provincial council and they have given their own self-governance, self-governance mechanism, right. So, then what happened? Subjects such as self-governance and their areas of concern, education, health, agriculture, housing, land, police are devolved to the provincial administration, similar to our state. So, you are also, our state, we have our own thing, right, policing, land, all these are under state control right in the same way provincial councils were also given certain rights so that in these particular sectors they will govern themselves they will administer themselves because of restrictions of financial power overriding powers given to the president the provincial administration have not made head away so now because of this provincial despite giving their own these sectors under them but at the end the overriding powers so, the discretionary powers on all these were put in the hands of president ensuring the unitary feature. So, are you able to understand? So, it is the, to ensure unitary features, the overriding powers of this provincial administration was given to president. At the same time, these sectors were given to the Tamilians to self-govern, right. Now, because of this overriding powers, their development was not up to the mark. But here the question is, this 13th amendment expired last month. Now, Sinhalese people are asking for further change in it. So, they are telling that, yes, we are the one who are suffering in these provincial areas, especially in these nine areas, they are a majority. So, they are telling that right now what is the update for us. So, that is about that article. And now, the issue is, currently Sri Lanka is not, get, not getting into any nation. So, they are like in a status quo mode. So, they have not come up proper nation. The issue here Sinhalese people are mentioning is because of India's pressure, because of India's uh, support for during this financial crisis, that is why you are not taking proper nation for this 13th amendment. That is what the issue started. So, that is entirely about that article. So, for the further reference, you can just go through this article. It is clearly mentioned why it is contentious, all these people. 
you can just go through. So that is about a proper gist out of what that article meant. I hope there is no issue with that. Yes. So that's it for today. Thank you for the session. Just go through the article. It will be clear for you. Thank you.